Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Tom Forden. I'm the chair and organiser of Grand Rounds. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some different faces, and I'm sure there'll be more people drifting in at the back as, the, as time goes by. And if you're watching us on the YouTube, then welcome to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you don't know about the YouTube channel, I can share the link with you. If you just search for Dundee uh, Grand Rounds, it's the only thing that pops up. We're the only one. And um, we've got uh, videos uploaded going back to 2015. I've got some 2014 videos which I'm trying to sort out. Um, and we have 145 uh, subscribers now. And the power of Google tells me we had a thousand minutes of viewing last month. So people are watching it. So thanks very much for taking part in that if you are watching it. Um, when we set up Grand Rounds in 2013, I think it was, we aimed to make it this a, uh, a multidisciplinary meeting, uh, which is welcoming and open doors to students, uh, to doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, and anyone in the university for, across all the schools. And we've always been very keen to get the dental school to come across um, town and talk to us. It's interesting, when I was at medical school 25 years ago, you know, I think we may have had one lecture on the, on the mouth and te well, at least the teeth. We had plenty of ENT lectures, but as far as the teeth went, the teeth are in the way when you're trying to do an ENT operation. Um, and in anaesthetics, don't break them. Um, yet the dentists spend six years doing a lot of medicine and a lot of work on, on the rest of the body, not just the mouth. And I mentioned in my email this morning, if you're, if you're a certain age like I am, when you go to the dentist now, you spend the first few minutes having your mouth checked for oral cancer and for signs of systemic disease. But I'm not sure how much time I spend looking at dentition, perhaps a little bit more than other people do, because poor dentition is associated very strongly with respiratory illness and uh, pneumonia, and certainly ventilated associated with pneumonia. So I'm very pleased that we've got Professor Peter Mossy's come across, made it the way across town to come and speak to us. I've, he tells me that he has been charged with speaking about revolutionary things in, in, in dentistry, and he's mentioned to me uh, dentistry without, without drills, changing the agenda of dentistry to include a, a general health uh, perspective. And I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. Uh, I, and um, I've had an email from one of our regular attenders saying that if he doesn't mention syphilis in this talk, then she wants her money back. <laughs> so we'll see. Okay. <laughs> oh, the money's coming back. <laughs> Professor Peter Mossy, everyone. Thanks very much. So good afternoon everybody and thanks uh, for, for turning out. I've always aspired to uh, come to this prestigious uh, forum and uh, lecture from this podium and uh, thanks to Tom for a brilliant introduction. Uh, it, look, it sounds as if I just need to put a bit of flesh on the bones or maybe a plaque on the teeth or whatever you want to say. But, um, but I, I'm delighted to get this opportunity because it's something which has... Uh, interested me tremendously over the last five years in particular since um, I joined one or two international uh, fora on uh, the interface uh, between uh, oral health and general health. Um, so I'm going to try and expand a bit. I've always also aspired to be on YouTube, so I'm delighted to hear that this is it's going. I've never had so much exposure in my life. Uh, so let's get ahead with uh, just a thought. This is relevant from um, a number of different perspectives, uh, but particularly the three logos, which I'm going to explain in a moment, because uh, from my profile there, you'll see I've got a foot in all three of those camps. Um, so I'm still a clinician. Uh, I do quite a lot of uh, basic science teaching and genetics. I did my PhD in genetics. Um, director of a World Health Organization collaborating center, which has given me some unique insights into the World Health Organization and how the, what makes them tick. Um, and I'm leading the global burden of disease uh, for cleft lip and palate within the World Health Organization. Um, I also have a couple of roles within the International Association for Dental Research. And um, the IADR uh, are the biggest uh, research organization in oral health in the world, uh, hold an annual meeting. But I'm in their Global Oral Health uh, Inequalities Research Network. I'm actually just about to become president of that, so sorry about the acronym, but that's about inequalities in health. Um, 
and I'm also chair of their Science Information Committee, which develops policy, and that's important as well. Um, uh, I'm Associate Dean for Internationalization at the Dental School, which gives me a role in internationalization, and therefore I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, insight into some of my uh, uh, contributions to health and oral health in India. And what has really sparked this uh, title um, is the uh, International Dental Federation. Uh, they call themselves FDI because it's in, in French. Uh, and their Vision 2030 committee has come up with this revolutionary idea that Tom mentioned that uh, we should be doing dentistry without drills. So, just for orientation, here's a slide um, that really everybody's familiar with here, the, the correlation and direct uh, correlation between health and wealth. So, if you look at um, this uh, top right-hand corner is all the wealthy uh, countries in Europe, US, UK, uh, and they are also, by virtue of the fact that they can access healthcare, uh, they're pretty healthy. Um, down in the uh, lower left-hand uh, corner, you have all the sub-Saharan African countries represented, uh, India as well, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, and here in the middle are a group of kind of low to middle income countries, um, some of them uh, more wealthy than others and with health in, in various states. But this projects um, one of the major problems and one of the major problems I'm trying to address, which is health inequalities. And everybody will know that the Sustainable Development Goals are now aiming towards universal health coverage with equality uh, across the spectrum. Uh, if I take India as an example, because I've done a lot of work in India, um, and you look at the profile uh, within uh, India, the um, uh, tremendous challenges they have are mainly at this in this day and age around the non-communicable diseases. Um, with enormous loss of productive life years, um, special predilection to cardiovascular disease, cancers, uh, respiratory uh, diseases, diabetes, obesity. And there's this progressive uh, reversal of the social gradients for risk factors, which means that uh, the lower socioeconomic groups have easier access now to unhealthy lifestyles, such as smoking and sugars, uh, and of course, uh, in dentistry, we're very concerned about that. So, um, the challenges within their health systems uh, are about lack of coordination and poor regulation, uh, health force challenges and uh, healthcare infrastructure challenges. Uh, data systems uh, tend to be weak and lack of public health capacity. So, all of those, we would say, we're in the NHS. In the UK, we're fine. Surely, uh, those are not the kind of challenges uh, that face uh, us. Sorry. However, we have our challenges. We have a system which I travel all over the world, and everybody says how fortunate you are. Uh, you've got the NHS in the UK. Fantastic system. Uh, and I say... Uh, I'm afraid I do not want you to follow the NHS model. Uh, it's a bit of a disaster. Because what we have, in fact, is a national sickness service. We do not have a national health service. We have a service whereby when people get ill, uh, they access the medical services. And by surgical or pharmacological means, uh, we nurse them back to health. And we usually pluck them uh, from the hospital and put them back into the environment where they get ill in the first place. So uh, that results in uh, spiralling costs and continuous uh, expenditure. And this is just uh, one example uh, of that. Um, and of course it also applies, that's the kind of diabetes obesity argument or the obesity aspect uh, of diabetes. But 
It applies uh, also to a whole range of other non-communicable diseases. You may be familiar with this, for it only happened last week, and uh, the Discovery Days. And I, I wasn't able to get to too many of the sessions, but I got to this one, and I saw these uh, three presentations. And throughout these three presentations, uh, there was something running through my mind, so I asked a question uh, at the end. But Morris Altman is the new dean of the School of Business. Uh, they now have their own school. And Morris is very interested in the interface between business and health. And I was delighted to hear that because he mentioned some of the things that uh, I would be keen to do myself. Um, Isla McKenzie did a very nice presentation uh, about uh, clinical research and uh, the development of new ways to treat disease. And David Gray uh, talked about the factory that they have in life sciences for developing new drugs. And my question afterwards was around the spiralling health costs that I've just mentioned and how we're going to continue uh, to afford uh, these kind of new drugs that have been uh, developed all the time. So I said, surely are we not better to think about other ways of treating disease? Uh, looking for prevention uh, as a way and a mechanism rather than continuing to treat. Uh, the uh, typical profile of someone over 70 or 75 these days is polypharmacy, multiple drugs. So it brought me back to this uh, forum in 2007 at the World Health Assembly. And because I was a WHO collaborating centre, I was invited along. And the WHO, for the first time in their history, said, we've got to go beyond infectious diseases. Uh, we've got to start thinking about non-communicable diseases as part of our portfolio that we support among our member states, in particular the developing world. So it was called the Non-Communicable Diseases Initiative. And, of course, the first thing they said is, we can't address every single non-communicable disease. That's going to be impossible. So we've got to in this forum decide which ones we're going to address. So they picked the top four. And as you will know, cardiovascular, cancers, respiratory disease, diabetes, obesity. And at that time, I wasn't really all that familiar with the agendas for these diseases. I was there really to think about birth defects because I was uh, a WHO collaborating centre for cleft lip and palate. Um, but there was no mention of birth defects or oral health or a whole range of other things that I was interested in. So they challenged um, us to think, how will we, uh, especially since I was a WHO collaborating centre, make representation to say, maybe you should be considering other diseases. So we came up with this, and just concentrate, sorry it's a busy slide, but on these risk factors. So... The risk factors for a lot, a lot of the non-communicable disease we've just mentioned, or the top four, uh, are tobacco, alcohol, diet, uh, stress, hygiene, and lack of exercise is actually the one that's missing there. Um, but in addition to their um, contribution uh, to cancers, respiratory diseases, cardiovascular disease, obesity and diabetes, all the oral diseases are there as well, as are birth defects. Uh, congenital anomalies. So we're, our argument back and we prepared uh, a paper over a couple of years to say surely we ought to adopt this common risk factor approach and we would therefore be able to address not just the top four but we'd be able to address uh, a whole range uh, of other non-communicable diseases including what I was interested in. Uh, so basically, we should be treating the risk factors rather than intervening when the risk factors have led to disease. So switch health policies from therapeutics to prevention, empower patients to manage uh, their susceptibility or uh, by behavioural change or amendable risk factors. And the other beauty of this, uh, because I'm very interested in inequalities, was it would simultaneously be addressing inequalities. So I'm going to give you a bit more insight into dentistry now and how disastrous we have been in our approach to, to health. 
uh, and, and to oral health. First of all, uh, dental diseases are the most prevalent of all uh, diseases, uh, all non-communicable diseases, affecting about 75% of the population. And even untreated caries, which is even worse, at least the, the dental caries is, uh, in the UK and the Western world is treated, there's a lot of untreated dental decay in the world, especially in the low and middle income countries. And in uh, recent years, um, we have decided that we ought to be leading the charge against sugars. Um, the, the FDI, IDR, and WHO are the three big dental bodies that I have a, um, uh, a foot in each uh, camp, are all concerned with this issue of, care, of uh, sugars, not only causing dental decay, but a whole range of other cardiovascular, uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity. And uh, in dentistry, we have already, and in fact for about the last decade, uh, taken on smoking, and we have been leading uh, the charge to make sure that smoking cessation therapies are part of the dental curriculum. But the mouth seems to be a separate entity, uh, and um, in fact Tom just referred to that. We don't know much uh, about how dentistry works, how the teeth work, how, how the jaws work. Um, and that's as much our fault as anybody else. We are not uh, putting dentistry um, into the forum where it should be. Um, and the rest of my slides will give some indication as to how dentistry goes well beyond the oral cavity. So, first of all, the issue of comorbidities and multimorbidities. Dental caries and periodontal disease don't happen uh, on their own. They happen in association with a whole range of medical conditions. Uh, again, Tom mentioned pneumonia. There's also all the ones I mentioned in cardiovascular uh, and uh, metabolic syndrome. And there's multiple signs and symptoms within the oral cavity that are risk indicators. They indicate uh, the possibility that you're developing or have developed uh, other uh, systemic diseases. And the other aspect is that in childhood, if you get off to the wrong trajectory and you develop the wrong habits, then that leads uh, to a lifelong uh, trajectory of illness. <clears throat> so the fact that dental uh, treatment in the form of uh, prevention uh, through uh, oral hygiene and diet begins in infancy uh, means that, and this Child Smile program that I've uh, put the logo here for is a government, Scottish government supported initiative uh, that all children born in Scotland have access to oral health care and to preventive care through toothbrushing and uh, uh, fluoride toothpaste uh, from birth. We also are very fortunate in Scotland that a very large proportion of the population are registered with a dentist. They don't all go, but there's a very high uh, registration. And this Child Smile initiative also has a very special aspect to it, which is described there as proportionate universalism. Really what it's saying is the greatest amount of resource should go to those in greatest need. So it's an attempt to um, address the inequalities issue. And dental professionals are encouraged to work collaboratively with their medical colleagues um, in the context of screening throughout the life course now as part of the, uh, the new vision. The other aspect that uh, I think is quite important to uh, appreciate is the mental health side and the psychosocial side and the effect that oral health has on general health and mental health. Um, and it's one of the areas that I think is still under-researched, but there's certainly some very good evidence emerging. And the other aspect of oral health that I deal with, uh, birth defects, uh, is something which is quite shocking in the, in the, in the current uh, world, because someone born with a cleft of the lip and palate in India 
uh, has an 85% chance of uh, death in the first couple of weeks of life. Uh, and that is due, uh, that very high mortality uh, is due to the uh, uh, issue of catastrophic expenditure because they believe that this little child has such a serious condition it will require a lifelong uh, course of treatment and that that would result in um, poverty uh, for the rest of the family. So they're, ha- they're called purposeful neglect in that they're happy to let these kids die. Um, the other uh, condition I've shown here uh, is quite shocking in that this doesn't occur in the Western world. It only occurs in the most impoverished uh, populations to the extent that the body does not have sufficient uh, immunity uh, to be able to cope with normal commensals that gather on their teeth and these become flesh-eating and gangrenous uh, in a condition uh, called cancromorous. Uh, it's only known in parts of sub-Saharan Africa and some very impoverished uh, parts of Southeast Asia and particularly India. <clears throat> The other aspect uh, of the the psychosocial and uh, marginalised groups uh, is there's one of our programmes at the dental school run by Professor Ruth Freeman uh, deals with uh, homelessness and prisoners. Those are her two big areas uh, of dealing with uh, the marginalised communities. Again, I'm not expecting you to read the detail, but it just shows someone... Who was trans, whose life was transformed uh, by intervention on oral health. Um, someone who was a, an alcoholic and a drug user, and uh, the teeth suffer seriously because of methadone, uh, and th- by virtue of um, oral intervention, uh, it was a, uh, he was able to be transformed in his outlook and his uh, subsequent life. And that's part of the program that is run by uh, Ruth Freeman. And the other thing that uh, this emphasises in the last couple of slides is the need uh, for us to consider as we develop our new strategies uh, to deal with inequalities. Um, The uh, issue of inequalities is made extremely difficult by virtue of, uh, of resource or lack of that in the Uh, developing world. Um, To get equity, you need to adopt the uh, Michael Marmot principle of proportionate universalism and put more resource into those in greatest need. But in any aspect of health improvement, it's very difficult to avoid this uh, uh, scenario where the actual reality is that those who are most able to afford health improvement are the ones who benefit. So Um, And the other aspect, just to mention dentistry for a final time, is that we have uh, unique access to one aspect of uh, what I consider to be extremely important, uh, uh, sport exercise and physical activity. And one of the downsides of that is the risk of trauma. It could be broken legs or broken arms or broken teeth. Um, And... Uh, one of the um, aspects of my life as an orthodontist is making sure that kids with big overjets or prominent teeth uh, are either given mouth guards or early orthodontic treatment. But dentists could also uh, provide a service by providing pre-participation cardiac screening, for example, uh, as a way of improving um, the safety of sport Oh, the final slide, of course, you can't fail to mention costs because dentistry over the years and decades has been extremely expensive. And uh, it's almost perverse uh, within the profession that there is a little um, appetite as well as emphasis on prevention because, of course, we benefit from the treatment uh, financially. And... uh, That's uh, the Global Burden of Disease uh, Health Economics Report, uh, 442 billion per year. And uh, when we consider that dental decay 
is preventable, uh, it makes it even more uh, perverse. And uh, periodontal disease is also ex exacerbated by lifestyle factors such as smoking and hygiene. Therefore, we do have opportunities in the preventive agenda to make significant cost savings. This was uh, an opportunity for the oral, uh, for the, um, the oral health profession or the, the dental profession uh, to build on, um, this is Margaret Chan who was the former Director General uh, of the uh, World Health Organization in a United Nations meeting. So when they uh, held that high level meeting in September 2011, oral health was mentioned. So at least there was an opportunity for the uh, oral health profession uh, to join in with uh, their medical uh, colleagues. And this is what led to um, what I said to, to Tom. I was uh, invited along to the Dundee Festival of the Future, and they said, you must do something disruptive, uh, and uh, so hence the anarchy and revolution. And I said, well... I can't think of anything more disruptive to dentists than uh, saying that you can't use a drill in the future. So we'll, um, we'll give you a lecture on how uh, we might change the culture within the dental profession. And FDI Vision 2030, which I now sit on, actually I've written in 2020, uh, 2030 uh, is believe the time is now right for developing a new model for oral health care, considering oral health as an integral part of general health um, and addressing the needs and demands uh, of the public through uh, oral health efforts. And that fits in very nicely with the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think are um, an incredibly uh, um, effective way of thinking about how we plan our future health strategies uh, going towards 2030. And uh, SDG 3 uh, is health and well-being, but there's a whole range of other aspects here where they do have health implications. And therefore we can uh, address uh, inequalities, for example, um, and uh, the hunger, poverty at the same time. And one of the big challenges in SDG 3 is this concept of universal health coverage. And the concept there is that cost should not be a barrier to access to care uh, in any, any aspect of care. So it's all about availability, accessibility and affordability. And yet, uh, here we are in the NHS uh, and in health systems all over the world uh, where we have a wasteful system that is continuing to spiral uh, out of control. And we are uh, too busy doing the interventions to think about the prevention. Um, and this is uh, why we need to switch to uh, the social determinants model and the prevention model. So the other concept that we, uh, in FDI and in WHO, we continue to say is it's not about health anymore. It's about health and well-being. So we must go beyond health. And that requires a new approach, uh, not only a new culture, but also a new way of addressing uh, health and, and social care together. Um, and that can be at population level, at community level, and I'll say a bit more about the individual level in a moment. And, of course, for affordability and universal health coverage, we have to think about revolutionising the workforce so that cheaper providers can provide the care that's required and adopt this uh, principle of proportionate universalism. Now, here's a couple of examples of what I think are people being inspired but doing the right thing in the right way. And this is uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Colin Palmer, and his, he's got, I know he's got a team here, and uh, um, He's driving towards this precision medicine and diabetes uh, research. So identifying the genetic predisposition so that you can tailor the, uh, the therapy, whether that be uh, uh, pharmacological uh, um, or uh, behavioral, 
um, to finding ways of um, preventing the disease. And in five years of collaboration with Colin, I actually introduced Colin to this chap at the bottom, who's uh, uh, Dr. Mohan from Chennai, because I was working with Dr. Mohan in Chennai on um, gestational diabetes and cleft lip and palate. Um, and I also had an interest in the common uh, factor that, um, uh, that links dentistry uh, and medicine, or the, one of the most important ones, which is sugars. Uh, and therefore, um, the oral health and diabetes health is, is very much uh, linked. So precision medicine um, and incorporating uh, personalised health coaching, which I'm going to, to mention, because that's the aspect that uh, myself and Colin have um, been speaking about uh, that uh, align very well uh, with identifying the individual's needs and then tailoring a programme uh, to, to uh, cater for those. And this uh, is something which I um, worked with European colleagues on, um, and it's a smartphone approach uh, to uh, <coughs> prevention of cleft lip and palate or congenital anomalies. And it's based on an initial uh, interview with the uh, patient or someone who's had a child with a cleft, uh, finding out what about their, their habits and their lifestyle factors, but also being able to do genetic tests to look at the predisposition. And we've done 20 years of research, and more recently GWAS, uh, to try to improve the genetic predisposition and the principle of identifying genetic predisposition. And then a program is agreed with the patient so that the patient takes responsibility for that delivering that longitudinal program. So uh, it's very sim similar to the diabetes uh, program that we have here, My Bi Diabetes My Way, and uh, a longitudinal program where you can monitor uh, your own health and aspects of that and uh, monitor progress over time. And uh, this slimmer, slimmer Zwanger means smarter pregnancy in Dutch. Uh, it was a Dutch uh, program was translated into English. Uh, so preconception e-health, uh, tailoring nutrition, diet, lifestyle, uh, coaching, um, along with the, uh, the knowledge of the genetic predisposition to environmental factors and uh, results in personalised coaching programme. So the one that was carried out as a pilot um, and uh, that was uh, a few years ago now, was uh, to look at the longitudinal effects uh, of folic acid uptake, which increased fruit and vegetable uh, intake, the healthier eating, and reduction in smoking. So just over 24 weeks, uh, the uh, benefits of that health coaching program um, were apparent. And in a very similar program in both Copenhagen and Turkey, uh, the HbA1c, which was also monitored, the glycosylated hemoglobin, was reduced by 5% over uh, a period of six months. So health coaching uh, does work. And I have another good colleague who have just developed a good relationship with here, um, uh, Callum Sutherland. And Callum and I have just submitted uh, an NIHR grant for uh, looking at health coaching um, as a tool for um, modifying um, the behaviour and preventing diabetes. Um, so health coaching is really uh, uh, adopting this common risk factor approach that I mentioned earlier in the talk. So in dentistry, we need to uh, convince the uh, colleagues in dentistry that um, the drilling and filling and billing uh, is not the correct way to approach it. We must instead address uh, the source of that, which is the risk factors, treat the risk factors, use motivational interviewing or health coaching as opposed to education. For the last 50 years, 
of dental education has shown that it's totally ineffective as a tool on its own. It does not work. It goes in one ear, out the other. So it has to be this more intensive uh, approach. And uh, looking uh, carefully at diet, uh, nutrition, exercise, uh, stress, hygiene, and if they're applicable, smoking and alcohol. Um, and that is the only way that I can perceive, and the, F, uh, the Vision uh, 2030 Committee perceive, that universal health coverage uh, can be achieved. So thanks for listening. Very much. I'll warm up the microphones, and Tom's already got his hand in the air. I was, I was uh, thinking at the beginning of your talk about you know looking in the mouth to look for for um, for uh, systemic disease, and if you, the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, has those questions every week, don't they? And um, I'm happy enough when they ask me a chest question, but as soon as there's a picture of a tongue, that's when it all gets a bit difficult, isn't it? And and I think that reflects up in my practice at least. That uh, I wasn't really taught any of that kind of stuff, and and and, and the answer is all well, obviously this is a blah 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 whatever it is. I do know how to see what looks, syphilis looks like, Sarah. Though, so that's okay. <laughs> right, Tom, I'll make my way over to see you. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. You need to be recorded for the YouTube channel, Tom. <laughs> Thanks, okay, Tom. Talk, Peter. Um, one of the interesting aspects of prevention, especially cardiovascular prevention, which I'm interested in, is that. It only really works if you treat the entire population. And if you focus in on people with risk factors, you don't prevent the burden of disease. Most people have events, don't have any traditional risk factors. And a lot of doctors have balked against implementing changes, whatever they may be, in completely normal people. So that's one of the things we have to get over. And that things like the polypill should be given to everyone, but nobody wants to do that and nobody wants to take them. The second thing is that whilst we all believe that precision medicine will actually be great, um, the way to operationalize this is really by regulation because medicine's regulation kind of makes people do it and that's what we're interested in doing is improving regulatory science. So if we get the evidence base that a drug's better in this group or worse in that group, mm -hmm. that will actually be implemented in the regulation. So there's these two points I think I'd like to make clear that we have a cultural problem with prevention and we also have a kind of cultural problem about the difference between precision medicine and mm -hmm. how you implement it. Excellent, yes. Those, those are exactly uh, the kind of issues that uh, we really do need to, to address. Uh, to take the second one first, there was an editorial uh, about a fortnight or three weeks ago in the British Dental Journal, Journal saying, dental public health with a stroke through the public, and it said political. So uh, there's absolutely no doubt that part of that um, approach is upstream but part of it is downstream as well. So the upstream approach is the sugar taxation, for example, the smoking banning and all of that. And I agree 100% that we'll never achieve those without that uh, regulatory approach. It has to be done as part of universal health coverage. And it's occupying quite a bit of my time and the committee's time at the moment, uh, working out the policy. Uh, I said I was um, chairing the Science Information Committee of IADR, We've just produced a policy on sugar, uh, and the one aspect of that policy that needs to uh, now be worked on, and we're working on it, is take it to the NCD Alliance, the Non-Communicable Disease Alliance, so that we can involve all the medical uh, specialties and medical interests and stakeholders within that. The second question uh, that you asked about was the precision medicine and the screening of the whole entire population. Now, my idea of this is that precision medicine is not just about genomics and it's not just about taking the blood sample and looking for genetic predisposition. It's also addressing this at an individual level in terms of lifestyle and a whole range of the risk factors. Uh, but uh, while we will never uh, achieve the, um, uh, the prevention, uh, 
by the upstream approach uh, alone, we will not achieve it either unless we adopt the uh, individual um, uh, intervention, but informed by the, uh, the precision medicine principle of the risk factors, that there are manifestations of a whole range of uh, disorders uh, in the mouth, and there are some of those that can be uh, uh, predicted um, or predictors of disease long before the disease happens. And the other aspect of this precision medicine is the longitudinal studies that are now coming out that have looked at, for example, Alzheimer's or, and going back 20 years to look at the biomarkers that could have been used to predict that because there's, there are huge studies and the consistency of association in looking at biomarkers and metabolomics uh, to identify that there were risk factors but they weren't identified and that could have been changed either by uh, pharmacogenomics or, uh, or drugs or behavioural uh, interventions. So I think it's an extremely difficult task, it's very complex, but I think it needs the uh, upstream and downstream working in parallel and also population level, community level and individual level. Uh, and that's where a lot of uh, the efforts um, are now going into in terms of the NCD research. Anybody? <coughs> oh, hang on. So, so I, 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 I don't think that you'd, you'd find much objection from this audience about um, the fact that we, we need to move to more, a more preventative strategy in health. I think... The, the, the difficulty that kind of you see is the, is the court of public opinion where you get, a few years ago there were, there were, you, there were headlines about um, sort of the amount of money the NHS was spending on sun cream and toothpaste, when actually if you supply under 16s with toothpaste and uh, sun cream, you probably will prevent it will almost certainly pay for itself mm. in the long run by preventing dental disease, <coughs> preventing skin cancer. Mm. So how, and I suppose on a, on a, on a second note, the, the population that tends to vote tends to be the people who've then got, got the end disease and not the, um, and not the, um, and not, not, the, not the people with the modifiable risk factors who, I mean, at 31, I'm probably kind of past that point now in that I've probably accumulated a lot of my risk factors already. Um, well, no. Um, but it, <laughs> Well, yeah, it, to an extent, I imagine it is. But um, you, how, how, do you win the, how do you win the hearts and minds or, or win that battle in terms of getting the, 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 the voting public... To, to buy into the idea that we should be treating disease, we should be preventing rather than treating disease. And I suppose what, what do you do in terms of expenditure when you've got um, people with a heart attack or dental caries? Um, do you deprioritise treating them rather than and, and to try to prevent the, what, the events of 30 years' time? Or, or do you have to double the health expenditure of the NHS for 10 years, for example? Yeah, there's, there's, there's obviously um, this transition. Um, we still have to treat disease. And therefore, uh, within dentistry, for example, uh, when we produce um, a statement on prevention uh, that doesn't include also care, there's lots of objections to that. And of course, there should be because we have to still supply the care. The... Um, uh, I'll tell you a, just a, a dental example of, of what you're saying as well is there was a recent um, uh, directive at global level uh, which again we had to deal with on mercury as uh, a contaminant in the environment and mercury is also a component of dental amalgam so the, uh, the dental profession were challenged to stop using uh, dental amalgam uh, because it was a contaminant for the environment. And, uh, but of course, um, when the uh, dentists uh, 
who have been using amalgam for all their lives and parts of the developing world where it's the only material that's available, uh, they refuse to accept the phase-out. So, yeah, even though it's a, um, a, one of these climate change type of arguments where there's the moral principle to do it, you can't change uh, the behaviour due to uh, economic and, uh, and social and entrenched uh, views. But what we feel is um, uh, the bigger argument is that we will not be able to um, get these um, uh, aspects of universal health coverage, for example, and social justice, unless we do modify uh, the culture. And therefore, the uh, new generations who we're appealing to um, need to accept that there is going to be a completely different uh, approach and different systems uh, to accessing uh, care and to taking responsibility for their own health. But uh, we still have, um, as you say, a lot of entrenched uh, habits and minds uh, that are going to be extremely difficult to change in the short term. But um, it's like the climate change is now becoming much more of an issue than it was 10 years ago. And I think this is going to be the same. Right, that's um, sparked some ongoing comment. There you go. Um, I think like, we are talking much too little about prevention. I think like, you know, one, one measurement would be to somehow put more sports into schools because that would address obesity, that would address, um, you know, like so many, you know, would implement healthy, healthy lifestyle and so on. So I think like healthy school meals and much more sport than is currently provided. And one thing that always like struck me when I come into the hospital is like, you know, it's amazing that we don't sell any sugary drinks in the hospital anymore. But I'm always astonished how much sugar and chocolate and sweets you still um, are still available at um, WH Smith and all these other um, shops. So in my in my opinion, like a hospital should be leading and have um, a healthy um, healthy canteen and no such thing up on the corridor. Yeah, and that seems to be um, uh, a, a very revolutionary thing now to say um, we're not going to have uh, any sugars. Uh, there's nowhere worse than the ninth floor of the dental hospital. <laughs> Uh, for eating cakes and sugars. But what I uh, noticed is the IADR, the International Association of Dental Research, have a meeting, an annual meeting, and we just, as chair of the SIC committee, um, uh, I was amazed at last year's uh, IADR committee that sugar-sweetened beverages, cakes, biscuits and everything were all over the place. That was your snacks. Uh, so... Um, we challenged that, and the IDR in Washington, D.C. in March this year is sugar-free. <laughs> so we're actually, uh, again, it's maybe just a small, uh, it would never have been thought of at any kind of meeting internationally that I've ever been at in the past. But it's now, good. I don't know whether you'll be searched going in or sweets taken out of your pockets. Or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but but it's a... It's a it's a step in the right direction kind of thing. But you're also right about sport. I mean, I am such a massive advocate of sport. That's for both physical and mental health. Sport. Yeah. Um, I've got a question just maybe at the other end of the spectrum. So if in an ideal world we prevent all of this, we get this perfect scenario where we have global health for everybody, we've got preventative medicine, what will we die of? because I don't think we will not die. And what will our end of life then look like? Will we then say, well, I had a great life and I'm now 90 and that's it. And I get whatever I then get, who knows, cancer, maybe because my cells keep dividing or my bones get really brittle because despite all of the prevention, it's not been, we all will get there at some point, probably yeah. later. We will probably have to put the pensions ages up as well, otherwise economically we cannot afford all these healthy old people who don't work. Um, so will we then say, when you're 90, you're going to get palliative care, a good quality, a good death, but we will not treat your cancer, we will not treat your heart disease that you then get? 
Yeah, a, f- a fantastic question. I mean, I, I, uh, I love your optimism, but, <laughs> uh, but also um, it was said to, to me, as I, I'm a bit of a fanatic about running and exercise, uh, that will it make me live any longer. Um, and I said, no, but I'll die a very healthy death. Uh, but yes, uh, I think um, the quality of life is what's important. And if you can have quality of life, quantity of life doesn't matter. Uh, well, uh, to, to an extent. Uh, and I think there will be uh, still massive challenges with things like cancer. Uh, I don't think we've managed to um, address, even though we know a lot more about it. Um, there's, there's different ways of cancer defeating us. Um. And that's very expensive. If you drop dead of that, that's actually quite cheap. And that's actually quite cheap. If you get cancer, yes. you're actually quite expensive. If you get Alzheimer's, you're also quite expensive because if you care. Yeah. And, and one of the uh, aspects that I've been advocating in health coaching um, requires the motivation of the individual and of course there's great variation in the way that people comply even with yeah, the, the healthy measures yes so so you in the last two years of life regardless and and that's probably a question for the health economists uh, because uh, even you're saying it's expensive it would be a fraction of what the expenditure is to treat those diseases at earlier stages of life. Right, I'm going to call things to a conclusion because we're only eight minutes to go until, it's, until they, I turn into a pumpkin. Um, I hope quality of life is important to some degree because I've booked a summer holiday. Um, uh, I was just thinking as I was sat over there that I, I see a lot of asthma patients. They don't take their inhalers. No one takes their inhalers. Like 7% of people comply with their inhalers. So I tell them in good faith, thinking this is a good idea, take your inhaler, then brush your teeth, because you'll never forget to brush your teeth. Because I grew up in a house where, of course, you'd never ever forget to brush your teeth, because that's what you do. But clearly that's not universal and something we need to work on. So, um, so perhaps you need to tell people to brush their teeth after they've had their inhaler. But I suspect um, as, as I'm losing that battle. Now, I'd just like to thank you very much for, for a thought-provoking talk. Thanks very much for coming. Um, next week it is chronic pain management. Who the people have put their heads in their hands already? Who doesn't have a, an anecdote of at least 100 patients they see who have chronic pain and the challenges that are associated with dealing with chronic pain? All of us see that across the whole of, uh, of this institution, and, and even in dentistry as well, I'm sure. So Professor Leslie Colvin is going to come and talk to us about the challenges of, of treating chronic pain. So please do come along to that. One last thank you for Professor Peter Mossy. Thanks very much.